A very good evening to you. You're watching Prime Time News on News First. I'm Saturanga Porachi. Let's first take a look at the headlines. Colombo Court said Economic Commission bill passed with amendments in Parliament. Police obstruct opposition's protest against the bill. Closed down the country for two weeks. Health specialists urge authorities. CBSL warns of economic damages if the country is closed. On to those stories in detail now. The Colombo Port City Economic Commission Bill was passed with amendments in Parliament today. The bill was passed in Parliament with a simple majority after the amendments were made in line with the Supreme Court determination. Number Port City Economic Commission bill was passed in Parliament with 149 votes in favour today. 58 votes were cast against the bill. Jatika Janabalavegya parliamentarian Vijita Herath had called for a vote on the bill after the second and third readings of the bill in Parliament. MP Vijay Dasa Rajapaksa did not attend today's parliamentary sittings, although constituent parties of the government voted in favour of the legislation. The Samagi Janabalavegya, Jatika Janabalavegya and the Tamil National Alliance voted against the bill. MPs Ali Sabri Rahim and Ishak Rahuman from the party led by Rishad Badyuddin voted in favour of the bill. However, MP M. Musharraf of the same party voted against the legislation. Five MPs of the Sri Lanka Muslim Congress were not present in the House at the time of the vote. Will the COVID-19 situation in the country improve by discussing the bill amidst the pandemic? Can the Prime Minister ask the people whether they are happy? Yesterday was War Heroes Day. Today is the day of betrayal. Today they are betraying the freedom that our country won. Dear Speaker, we believe that this bill is not only a threat but an attack on the country's sovereignty, national resources, political freedom and unitary status. This bill is one which has explicitly violated the country's constitution. This is the so-called genuine intention and the vision of the government. Generally, when a bill is prepared, it is done by the legal draftsman. But do the members of the government know as to who drafted this bill? It was a female lawyer in a company. That is the truth. Is this the government's vision? 34.6% of the bill is in violation of the constitution. We will propose amendments to the bill as well. But that doesn't imply that we support the bill. What is Venerable Ale Gunavansatero, who backed the government into power, saying? He is calling on the government to hand over the country just as it was previously. The vote on the Port City Bill will identify the patriots and traitors. Venerable Ale Gunavansatero, who considered to be a good person when they won the election. Now they are asking us to paint a good image of him. This is a group that offends monks. This is the stance of the government. They are attacking the monks who supported them in coming into power. Which parliamentarian was it? If possible, please stand up and identify yourself. It is the parliamentarian from Dulapitiya. China is always in favor of the Sri Lankan government. Therefore, we understand your anti-Chinese sentiments. We're looking at the port city through an anti-Chinese lens. We cannot prevent the fears from arising. Have we allowed China to establish a military base? Has the area been transformed into a military base at least? They are stirring up false fears. This is a financial city. Investments are not just from China, but from the US, India or any government can also be made in this area. Only approximately 25% of the land area has been leased out to China for 99 years. Attempting to transform this country into a federal state and to influence our politics will only be aims that are limited to dreams when our economy becomes strong and when we overcome the foreign exchange crisis. That is why the US ambassador sees the port city as a money laundering hub. This is a part of Sri Lanka's land. It is not a threat to our sovereignty. This is a new city that is being built. It is an artificial land. There is no election in that area. It is a financial city. Foreigners and locals can reside in that area. A local residing in that area can own a house in another part of the country. That person might have voting rights in that area. We are passing this bill because this area belongs to this country. They were spreading blatant lies. They said that a person would require a visa to enter the area. Kabir Hashim had made such a statement recently as well. He claimed that those provisions were abolished after going to court. Which provision mentioned that? <laughs> 
విసి నమవని పిటి విసి హతరవని పేలి విసాక గాన్నోని కీలు తీన ఏక తుడ్డాను ఏక వినాశకర మంత్రి తుమా తమున్నాసి కీన ఓనమ దడువు మగడ మల్ల ఎస్టి పులు అన్నం పెల కొకియవన్ ఉది ఈ పడ దిందు మొడ విసి నమవని పిటే గారు అమంతి తుమా టు రిసై టు బి ఎంప్లాయ్డ్ ఆర్ టు విజిట్ ఇతకొట ద 29th పేజ్ కంప్రైజర్స్ ఆఫ్ ద వర్డ్స్ టు రిసైడ్ ఇన్ టు బి ఎంప్లాయ్డ్ or to visit therefore the supreme court ordered that a two thirds majority is required to retain the word to visit therefore the government has proposed to amend clause 30 in page 29 by removing the word visit and restrict it to the word employed this would mean that those seeking employment can obtain a work permit and those visiting will not require such a document i am reading what is on this document that provision talks about investments it does not refer to a visa visas are processed through the immigration and emigration department these are the lies that are being said they said that the bill brought forward by the government is harmful we will bring whatever bill we want anyone who opposes it can go to court we will not do this during the committee stage debate if there are dangerous provisions the supreme court will order the removal of such clauses we will remove it this is a government that respects the law and an administration that respects the court this is not the government that will evade the law during the committee stages get to the and walk away This is a political project and a project of a single family. With this team on one side, Honorable Deputy Speaker, on the other side you get the China Harbour Company. This China Harbour Company has a current account at Standard Chartered Bank under the account number 01335919. On the 12th of December 2014, by the cheque bearing the number 981321, 40 million rupees from this account was transferred. On the 7th of January 2015 through this check bearing the number 981328 25 million rupees had been transferred on the 2nd of January 2015 through the check bearing the number 981333 another 25 million rupees had been transferred on the 7th of January 2015 the day before the election this account through the check bearing the number 981335 transferred 25 million rupees on the 31st of December 2014 through the checks bearing the numbers 981319 and 981320 58 million rupees was transferred who were these funds transferred to they were transferred to the election campaign of the then presidential candidate mahindra rajapaksa million panasa tak nidas karo kaata me mudal nidas karan ne velave janadhipati varne mahindra rajapaksa mahatma ke desh palana vedavala ta mr bavi mantri bari ekudi virud if an accusation is made against a member of this house that purports to attribute him to a corrupt or improper conduct a motion must be filed before such an allegation is made metane sandhan karanne be yojanawak anuware obutuma kiyene ke yam reethi prashna according to that rule there is an issue but we must look as to if whether the story is true or not but i am happy that vasudevanana akara did not challenge the truthfulness of the facts that i presented for that i am thankful to him toroturu verdi kela kiyanne ekena mam etumata istutu antino china habar ekene obutuma menne metuna adame etuma ginahanna menne metenda gihilla havas enawa chanda denna garu niyojaka you ask your prime minister here he will come to parliament in the evening to vote honorable deputy speaker it is not only i who say this even the new york times in america reported that 7.3 million was transferred to him at the time the prime minister vowed in parliament that he will file legal action against them we were waiting until he filed the case then the cict company it was the company that took over the development of the colombo south terminal of the colombo port that company transferred 19.4 million through the check bearing the number 594191 Where is the money transferred to the Pushpa Rajpaksa Foundation so now who are the parties of this deal what is this company that is involved in the port city project that spans across 162 hectares and will be leased out for 99 years this is the company that spent millions in sri lanka to create these corrupt politicians honorable deputy speaker i know some of the venerable theros were given money by this company that is the nature of this company so this is not a company that is clean this is not a legal issue there are very dirty deals that have taken place here this is a law that was formulated to facilitate the transfer of the land and money of the general public to be stolen from the back door i question the mps of this parliament why are you raising your hands for this bill that allows so many powers to be allocated to this corrupt company There is a story in our history books where a rich man who owned a lot of land destroyed all of his wealth in the end and sold his land to a resident of an urban area now he has lost his income he has no way to live he is starving what does he do balagrin ek athulu kurumba kapana kurumba made galawanna assa kapana idi mokada karanne watta badudila assata dathaniyamaniyam innu meka thamai wenne
Meanwhile, the National People's Power Movement made a revelation at a media briefing held today. Panas Namesa Hataveni Vagantia Tule Tamai Tiene Samadam Panata Anu. Clause 59 and 60 of the bill states that a company will be set up to manage the land in the area of authority of the port city. That company will provide the services inside the port city. According to Clause 60A, this company will provide utility services such as gas, water, electricity, internet and communication facilities, sewerage and drainage, waste and garbage disposal and such other facilities to authorized persons, residents, occupiers and visitors in the area of authority of the Colombo Port City. So to provide these services, a separate company needs to be established under the Companies Act. This is the business card of Chatura Cabral, the son of Ajit Nivad Cabral. His designation on the card says Manager, State Management, and the company name is Port City Colombo Private Limited. This belongs to the son of Ajit Nivad Cabral. We propose to rid this bill of these complexities. It would be better if the bill itself said that the management of the land at the port city will be provided to this specific company. They could have mentioned that it is a Rajapaksa company. They are trying to hide this in the bill. Do you know why? This is where the demand is. This is where the commissions are. It is because they want to establish this company that they are now passing this act in a hurry. A share of this company will be valued in the millions. The company has been established before the bill is passed. We see this as a national tragedy. When we made inquiries from Chatura Cabral regarding these allegations, he responded by saying that inquiries should be made regarding the matter from State Minister Ajit Nivad Cabral and the media spokesperson of the CHEC Colombo Private Limited project, Kasapa Senarath. When contacted, Kasapa Senarath said that Chatura Cabral was employed at the company since 2016. A group of Samagi Janabalavege parliamentarians staged a protest near the parliamentary complex on the Colombo Port City Economic Commission bill today. However, the police had informed the group of lawmakers that the protest flouts quarantine regulations. <laughs> This is the second betrayal of the country. The first betrayal was done by people like Don Juan Dharmapala. This is the second attempt. Convening 225 MPs has been allowed by violating the interprovincial restrictions. Parliamentarians are seated in Parliament without maintaining a distance of one meter, but staging a demonstration is claimed to be bad. <laughs> The Samagi Jana Balavege staged a silent protest along the road opposite the entrance to the parliament. The protesters staged the demonstration by setting a copy of the Port City Bill on fire. Who are the parliamentarians who voted in favour of the Colombo Port City Economic Commission Bill in Parliament today? Tonight, we outline how MPs from the Colombo, Gampaha and Kaluthara districts voted on this piece of legislation. The following MPs from the Colombo district voted in favour of the bill. Udaya Gamantila, Gamini Lohuge, Jagat Kumara, Dinesh Gunawardana, Pradeep Udugoda, Premanatsi Dolavatta, Bandula Gunawardana, Madhura Vitanagi, Vimal Viravansa, Sarat Vira Sekara, Susil Prema Jayanta. The Colombo district MPs who voted against the bill 
Our opposition leader, Sajid Premadasa, SM Marikar, Manu Ganeshan, Dr. Harsha De Silva, partly Champika Ranavaka, and the Jatika Janabalavegya leader, Anrukumara Desa Nayaka. MPs who abstained from voting are Dr. Vijay Dasa Rajapaksa and Mujiba Rahman. MP Mujiba Rahman was absent from today's session as he has contracted COVID-19. The Gampa district MPs who voted in favour of the bill are Indika Anuruddha, Upul Mahendra Rajapaksa, Sahan Pradeep Vitana, Kokila Gunavardhana, Nalin Fernando, Nalak Godaheva, Nimal Lanza, Prasanna Ranatunga, Prasanna Ranavira, Milan Jayatilaka, Lasanta Alagevanna, Sisira Jayakodi and Sudarshini Fernando Pillay. The Gampa district MPs who voted against the bill are Field Marshal Sarat Fonseca, Kavinda Jayawardhana, Ajit Mana Peruma, Harshana Raja Karuna and Vijita Herat from the National People's Power Movement. The Kalutara district MPs who voted in favour of the bill are Anupa Pesquel, Jayanta Samaravira, Pial Nishanta De Silva, Rohit Abeguna Wardhana, Lalit Elavala and Sanjeeva Edirimana. The MPs who opposed the bill from this district are Kumar Vilgama and Rajat Sena Ratna. MPs Vidura Vikramanayaka and Mahinda Samarasingha did not attend today's parliamentary sittings. Bellboys got you covered. Download Bellboy today to get all your household appliance fixing and repairs done. Now available on Android and iOS. Welcome back to the news. President Gotabe Rajapaksa has said he believes that investors from all parts of the world will make use of the Colombo port city. He made these remarks while delivering an online address during the 26th International Conference on the Future of Asia. The two-day conference began in the Japanese capital of Tokyo today. The port city will be a gateway to South Asia. It will create a vibrant new city space incorporating an international financial center, a marina district, outstanding residential and commercial facilities as well as world-class infrastructure all within a tropical beachside paradise. New legislation that will ensure an attractive environment for investors and greater ease of doing business within the port city has been prepared and is before parliament. I am confident that investors from all over the world will benefit greatly from these initiatives and from the port city's unique geostrategic position at the heart of one of the most rapidly advancing regions in the world. I invite all nations to encourage their businesses to take advantage of this opportunity and to be part of what will become a key service hub to this region in the future. We are much interested in the, your uh, diplomatic policy. Last month, and you conveyed a very friendly message to visiting Chinese Defense Minister uh, General Wei Fenfo. In this regard, as a South Asian nation, and how do you balance the relationship with China and India from now? As a developing country, Sri Lanka wishes to obtain the support of all partner nations to fast track our development aspirations and improve the livelihoods of our people. We are aware of world power rivalries and regional power dynamics. Our foreign policy is neutral. We consider India our closest neighbor and a long-standing friend and we understand their security concerns and sensitivities. We will never allow anyone to use Sri Lanka to jeopardize India's security. We will work closely with India and all regional partners to ensure that the Indian Ocean remains secure for the benefit of all countries. According to the President's media division, the Japanese Prime Minister Yoshida Suga, Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan, Nepalese Prime Minister KP Sharma, and the leaders of several other states were present during the 26th International Conference on the Future of Asia. 
Meanwhile, Chinese ambassador to Sri Lanka, Ki Zeng Hong, has informed President Gotabe Rajapaksa that a donation of 500,000 Sinopharm vaccines from China will reach Sri Lanka next Tuesday. The ambassador had conveyed the message to the president during a special discussion yesterday. Sri Lanka has placed an order for 14 million doses of the Sinopharm vaccine as well. The president's media division noted that 3 million doses will reach the country by July. Special request by medical experts on COVID-19 prevention. A scientific approach to combat COVID-19 which involves a two-week countrywide lockdown has been published by medical experts. The scientific strategy to combat COVID-19 in the country has been formulated by Professor Malik Piris, attached to the School of Public Health at the University of Hong Kong, and Professor Kamini Mendis, a former malaria expert at the World Health Organization. The strategy had been devised following discussions with several epidemiology and disease control experts. The strategy published recently cautions that the current strain of the virus is spreading faster than previous waves of the COVID-19 infections. The experts highlight the importance for a scientific approach in dealing with the pandemic as the strain of the COVID-19 virus detected in Indonesia has been identified in Sri Lanka as well. The document points out that the capacity of the health system to manage COVID-19 patients has already exceeded, resulting in inevitable consequences of more avoidable deaths. It adds that small area isolations prohibiting inter-provincial travel, intermittent and short period lockdowns together with mild restrictions on human movement will not arrest this wave of the pandemic. While introducing different approaches, the experts have also outlined the economic impact of implementing these moves. The recommendations are all essential services to remain functional, a minimum number of grocery stores and pharmacies to remain open in every district, a limited number of vegetable, fruit, fish, meat, bakery and other food delivery vehicles permitted to operate on the basis of permits, restaurants able to prepare food for delivery on order but not allowed in-house dining, government departments deemed essential to keep an office open for a few hours a day and function with a skeleton staff on a roster basis. Any organization or enterprise may allow its employees to work from home. A person can leave home only for health needs or for any other emergency or to purchase food supplies, but only one person can leave home at any one time for these purposes. Gatherings of more than four people to be prohibited and outdoor agricultural work permitted to continue. Inevitably, the deaths lag the cases by a period, by at least uh, 10 days or two weeks. The, the case, the impact on mortality of this huge increase of cases, we still have not felt that will be felt in the next couple of weeks. So we, we do have quite a, uh, a, a worrisome situation on our hands. Now, you, you, you have seen some of the interventions that have been put into place, for example, limiting uh, travel between provinces. But if you just look at the data, if you just look at the cases during the last seven, seven days, you can see that now cases are present in every province in the country. If you look at the increase compared to the previous week, you can see that in most provinces, the, there is dramatic increase. So stopping, trans, stopping people moving from one province to another is not really going to reduce transmission at this stage. Maybe if it had been introduced back in the middle of April, it might have had an impact, but not now. We definitely recommend keeping people at home for at least two weeks so that we can curb the spread of this disease. The incubation period of this virus is between 2 to 14 days. If people stay home for a period of 14 days, there won't be a possibility of them contracting the virus. This will also prevent them from heading out. As a community specialist, I recommend we break this cycle. Sri Lanka recorded 2,780 more COVID-19 infections today, raising the total infections up to 154,123. Official figures indicate that 36 deaths were confirmed yesterday, bringing the total number of deaths due to the virus up to 1,051. No COVID-19 deaths have been reported so far today. According to the Health Ministry, 123,532 infected individuals have recovered from the virus, while 30,707 are under medical care.
Meanwhile, a discourse has arisen on a directive issued by the Health Secretary informing health sector officials to refrain from providing information to the media. We have constantly reminded state officials to avoid making statements to the media without the approval of authorized officers. We had issued a reminder in this regard recently as well, otherwise it will severely affect our administration process. We don't have an intention to impose a lockdown, but the people must be kept informed properly. We receive information through the media, otherwise it would be correct to say that no one else provides us with the information. There is no proper official to resolve the health crisis. If we fix the shortcomings in the health ministry after inquiring into them, we will be able to eliminate the COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> There are several matters which require attention along with several shortcomings as well. Failing to do anything about it will result in a disastrous situation. The president is the last person to be informed on these matters. That too, only if we tell it to the media. Withdraw these directives. Don't prompt us to engage in strikes or trade union actions. <laughs> Several infected individuals are trapped inside their homes while being unable to receive treatment at hospitals. A situation in which patients die within a short period of time after being admitted to hospitals has arisen. There is a possibility that these deaths could have been avoided if they had been subjected to medical supervision much earlier. The main reason for this situation is because the health ministry has not provided adequate information. It would be better if the health secretary can inform the relevant units to issue the relevant information. If they are trying to violate a person's right to express their views freely, we wish to state that we will not allow that. That is because democratic rights are being violated in several sectors of this country with the intervention of the state. During a press briefing today, the governor of the central bank, Professor W.D. Lakshman, said an island-wide lockdown to curb the spread of COVID-19 will have a negative impact on the Sri Lankan economy. Unlike the first and second COVID waves in Sri Lanka, the lockdown has only been imposed on a few selected areas. We are also witnessing progress in the vaccination program. Furthermore, many institutions in the corporate sector have adapted to a work-from-home culture. Due to these reasons, we believe that the impact caused by the third wave on the economy will be less than the impact caused by the first and second waves. However, the third wave will negatively affect government revenue and economic growth. Views were also expressed on managing the COVID-19 crisis in the country. The COVID-19 pandemic and its resultant measures primarily affect the poor communities that account for approximately 30% of our total population. We all have a responsibility to take care of them. The government is responsible for their welfare as well. In my view, if the current program in place proves to be a success, we can carry out activities in a more protective manner while ensuring the economic welfare of everyone. The health sector has warned us that the new COVID variant is more dangerous than the previous ones. Considering the situation in India, the health sector is urging the government to impose an island-wide lockdown for a minimum of two weeks. We are of the stance that we should try our best to address this issue without an island-wide lockdown. However, such a decision can only be determined based on the situation in the upcoming days. As a representative of the government and the medical officials, can you confirm that there will be a lockdown? <laughs> Meanwhile, the central bank, in its fourth monetary policy review, decided to maintain the standing deposit facility rate and the standing lending facility rate at their current levels of 4.5% and 5.5% respectively. Central Bank Governor Professor W.D. Lakshman said efforts are currently underway to increase foreign financing inflows to Sri Lanka required to meet the country's debt service obligations. The receipts of the IMF SDR allocation due to us of around $800 million will bolster Sri Lanka's external sector. 
we are also expecting to relax the regulatory environment enabling financial sector and corporate sector to mobilize capital from abroad by fast tracking approval process the central bank assured that the imf sdr allocation to sri lanka will have no conditions uh, the respect to departments are uh, working along these lines these days uh, so the allocation uh, is expected somewhere in august so to our knowledge uh, there will be no uh, conditions uh, attached to it. In your sports news, Shami Silva was elected as the chairman of Sri Lanka Cricket for the next two years in an uncontested election today. The election for the office bearers of Sri Lanka Cricket for the years 2021 to 2023 was held via Zoom technology today. A statement issued by Sri Lanka Cricket said that former chairman Shami Silva was re-elected to the post in an uncontested poll. The position for the other office bearers went uncontested after K. Madhivanan had withdrawn his nominations for the Sri Lanka Cricket election. Former Secretary Mohan De Silva too was re-elected to the post after Lasantha Vikramasinghe was appointed as the treasurer. Jayanta Dharmadasa and Ravin Vikramaratna will work in the capacity of vice presidents. Krishanta Kapuatta was appointed as the deputy secretary and Sujiva Godaliadda will act as the deputy treasurer. That's all the news we have for you this evening. It was a pleasure to have you with us. We urge you to watch all of these and more on our website www.newsfirst.lk. I'm Satran Hapwarachi. Good night and take care.